My name's Jerry Bergen. I was married to my wife, Cartini, for 23 years, and she died of ovarian cancer in October 2006. The discovery of, of, of Tinny's uh, uh, situation, the, the cancer that she had, I think it crept upon us very, very slowly. She didn't appear to have any serious symptoms. But again, in, I guess, in Indonesian culture, it's, it's the norm for people to keep things like that to themselves. She didn't seem to be in any pain. I believe her menstrual cycles were, were normal. But uh, what happened was, was that uh, one day she, she said to me that she had this lump in her, in her, in her belly and that she wanted to go and, and, and try and find out what it was. Because at that time my son was under, under chemo treatment for his condition in Singapore, not a problem. The next time we came up to Singapore with my son, uh, my wife came with me, we found her a gynecologist, and the gynecologist uh, gave her a USG, and there was a, a, a lump on the left hand, uh, left hand side of her belly which we understood to be a fibroid. It was giving her very little discomfort, and so, and the doctor said it was small, and so at that point, um, there didn't seem to be any urgency to do anything about it. So we didn't do anything about it at that point. As time progressed, and of course now that she realized that this, this lump was there, the lump did get bigger, and it came to the point uh, uh, that the doctor, her, her gynecologist, uh, thought that she should have what was uh, billed as a, a small operation to, to remove the fibroid. I believe at that time she did have some abdominal pain and, uh, and so we decided to go ahead and, and have this uh, the small operation. The operation was a total shock. I would brought, brought Tinny up, uh, taken to the hospital in the morning. It was going to be an evening operation. And so as soon as she was taken into theatre for what I thought was going to be a, a 30 minute, 45 minute operation, I went out and found somewhere to have something to eat. I got back to, the, to Mount E, to the hospital, and there were three doctors waiting for me. And they gave me the, the shocking news that it wasn't a fibroid, uh, it was a, a cancer mass. Her left ovary and left fallopian tube was, was completely enmassed and, and, and large. Her right side wasn't too bad. And at that point, I had to give the approvals for them to go ahead and give her a full hysterectomy. That was made a little bit worse even because they'd had to call in a lower bowel surgeon because um, the cancerous mass had stuck to her colon and they didn't know at that time whether they were going to be able to separate the two. Fortunately, they were able to separate the mass from her colon and, and she did not require the colostomy. After the operation, um, of course, I was, I was shocked with what happened during the operation and, and I was the one that had to go and give the word to my wife that um, the operation was a little more intricate than, than we'd originally thought. She was devastated. The children were obviously shocked. Um, they, they were shocked that their, that their mum had again gone to Singapore for a minor operation and you know had, be, had found out to have cancer. Well, of course, as soon as, as, soon as Tinny had had the operation and they found out what, uh, what had happened, I guess they also had a, a good look round while they were in there and one of the doctors had picked up that there was many white dots in her mesentery, in her belly cavity lining, and told me that they were probably cancer. The cancer had begun in her ovary. It had spread. I talked to an oncologist, and he said that Tinny was gonna have to go through a full regimen of um, chemotherapy, and that the cancer was a type that was quite aggressive. Ovarian cancer is otherwise known as the silent killer because it is the most deadly gynecological cancer as it doesn't have much symptoms and three quarters of them are detected in the stage three to four. Ovarian cancer can affect almost anybody because the risk is as high as one in 81. But um, not having children, 
is one of the minor risk factors because theoretically speaking, uh, every month when you ovulate, it damages the surface of the ovary and sometimes the damage is not repaired, it causes you to get cancer in future. But when you, one is pregnant, you don't ovulate for about nine months. So the more pregnancies you have, the less ovulation you have and uh, hopefully you have less damage to the ovaries. Another risk factor for ovarian cancer would be the inheritance of a genetic and abnormal genes. For example, Angelina Jolie, she had the BRCA1 gene and this would increase her, uh, her risk of having uh, ovarian cancer to about 40%. So um, having a strong family history is one of the major risk factors. Ovarian cancer is the most deadly because the cases are diagnosed late when they are stage 3 to 4, when patients have symptoms such as spread to other places in their body. So those patients will be harder to cure. And uh, because ovarian cancer do not have many symptoms that will point towards the ovary. For example, symptoms of ovarian cancer can be in the form of bloatedness, can be in the form of like uh, urinary symptoms and bowel symptoms because of the mass pressing against the bowel and the bladder it can be in the form of not wanting to eat because there's something taking up space in the tummy so all these are very vague so very few people will think that hey it's maybe because of something growing on the ovary and ovarian cancer do not bleed abnormally that's an interesting thing because cervical cancer uterine cancer they bleed ovarian cancer because it really doesn't communicate with the bleeding track i mean where, where, where you bleed for in monthly menses they usually don't cause bleeding disorders the chemotherapy process was not very nice to go through. You know, and again, I had to fly them up from, from Jakarta uh, and, and they needed a lot of tender, loving care. And you know, all you, all you feel you want to do in those circumstances, the only place you want to be is home. Throughout this whole period, you know, between the chemotherapy and, and what happened afterwards, these, these lumps were growing and they were growing quite large. And my wife was getting sicker, and, and towards the end, she, she couldn't eat. What was happening was that uh, the cancers had, had uh, coagulated. They'd grown together and grown so big that they'd started to nip her digestive tract, and she couldn't pass anything. And if you can't pass anything, you can't eat anything. And uh, just before the end, because of this vomiting problem, again, we came back to Singapore to see the doctors. They inserted a device into her belly that constantly dripped chemotherapy drugs onto this mass that was constricting her bowel in an effort to kill it, in an effort to, to reduce the size so the bowel would open up and unfortunately that didn't work or it didn't work as quickly as she wanted it to work. And after 10 days, she made a conscious decision that she wanted to go home and die. So we talked to the, the doctors in Singapore. Uh, they got in touch with her doctor in Jakarta. She was checked out of hospital. We got on an aircraft. We flew to Jakarta and 10 days later she died. To be diagnosed with ovarian cancer stage 3 or 4, that means that the tumour has um, spread beyond the ovary. So my first assessment of the patient will be whether or not I can operate. Because if I can operate and confidently take out all the disease that has spread, I would operate um, before we give her chemotherapy. There's this uh, concept of new age driven chemotherapy whereby we give chemotherapy first to shrink the tumour before we go in for the operation. That might be a suitable approach for patients with very bad spread, where the surgery might be very morbid, would, would be very, uh, might lose a lot of blood, take a long time, or if the surgery is not enough to remove all the cancer. For example, if the tumour has spread to the lungs, my surgery will not be able to remove all the tumour that has spread to the lungs, for example. Then we use the chemo to downstage the disease, to cut down the disease before we go in for the operation. After you've been diagnosed with stage 3 to 4 cancer, um, the survival rate is, in terms of 5 year survival, is maybe about 30 to 40 percent. But thankfully, because we're having more and more no new chemo agents coming in, maybe about 6 to 7 different lines of chemo agents coming in, we are able to prolong survival by a lot more than what we used to be able to do so. We're hoping that in the near future, I mean, we will increase this number from 30 to 40, maybe 50 to 60. 
Traditionally, chemo agents used to be like a poison whereby they poison away the cancer cells, right? But now we do know that cancer cells differ a little bit from uh, normal cells in the sense that they have certain factors on it. So there's this new category of drugs known as targeted therapy, which targets the cancer cells alone. And this has been promising for certain cancers, including ovarian cancer, to prolong survival. So this is a different class of drugs that have come in. And when I say different lines of chemotherapy, it means that different agents that can be used sequentially. For example, if you don't respond to the first line, you use the second line like backup plans. Unfortunately, we may not be able to cure all patients with cancer. But the eventuality is that if you have an advanced cancer, there is still a high chance that you may pass away from it. For ovarian cancer, the terminal event could vary, but most of the time it's because you cannot digest your food well and you eventually waste away because ovary cancer is something that affects the tummy and affects your digestion system. My wife went for fairly regular, normal medical checkups. Blood pressure, blood work. To my knowledge, she did not go for any type of ovarian cancer scan. I believe she went for a mammogram, but that wasn't the problem. Whether it all happened very, very quickly, or, or whether the, she didn't go for the correct tests, should all women go? Probably. Ovarian cancer is a, a silent killer. As I said, with Tinny, there was no apparent symptoms. I don't know, I can't, can't comment on how quickly this thing grew, but there was no apparent symptoms until the so-called fibroid, what was thought to be a fibroid, appeared. And by that time, it was way, way too late. Yeah, I believe it, it was the worst stage. I think, I think it's stage four. Because it, it's so silent, as a lot of cancers are, if there is a methodology out there that's easy to use, that's easy to interpret, and it's easy to, to do, I don't see why every woman in the world shouldn't do it. As in my wife's case, once she had that first symptom, it was, it was too late. Everybody's frightened when they go for a scan or a screen because they, they're frightened of bad news. They don't want to hear bad news. Just think what you're doing to your children. To reduce the risk of ovarian cancer, we can um, encourage people to have children more. More children, all right? As I've said, if you rest the ovaries, hopefully it will have less chance of cancer change. Another effective method of reducing ovarian cancer will be by taking the oral contraceptive pill because the, it does the same theory whereby it prevents ovulation. And by preventing ovulation, the ovaries are in a quiet state. Hopefully the um, abnormal cell change do not occur so quickly. Certain studies have shown that if you've taken the pill for more than five years, you cut the risk of womb cancer and ovarian cancer by 50%. So in certain patients, for example, with the BRCA1 or 2 mutation who do not want to remove their ovaries too early, we actually put them on the pill as a form of uh, prevention of ovarian cancer. And unfortunately, there are no um, screening methods that one can do regularly, but just take note that they may have very small symptoms. For example, like if you're bloated, if you have urinary symptoms, bowel symptoms, and um, just pain below that you cannot explain. If you have such symptoms that are more frequent, that doesn't go away with time, and it is something new in your life, see a doctor, because um, by internal examination, by ultrasounds, we can detect ovarian cancer a little bit earlier.